We are at crossroads, that's quite clear from all your future perspectives. We are again at crossroads. Um, but how much faith and why can we have in the present ruling class, the, the people who are now our, our politicians, our bankers, our economists, our, the media tycons, there's, there's an, they are the change makers, right? So there's an, an, uh, how much can we expect from them? Paragraphs, you are in your book, How to Run the World, quite optimistic, I may say, uh, when it comes down to humanitarians, um, uh, uh, um, you, you talk about mega diplomacy as, as a way out. So give us some hope. Well, actually in the spirit of what Rory was saying, that book is extraordinarily pessimistic about global structures, grand solutions. It's, it's the anti-global governance book about global governance. It's the book about the triumph of the local over the global. So it's exactly in the spirit of what Rory was saying. And I find that, you know, in, in our first comments, we were quite uh, either or. I think that, to, to sort of sum it up, none, none of us wanted to take a position and say that a, a technological age is definitely going to be good or bad. And I think that that's healthy. We, nuclear power can heat homes or it can destroy nations. And we know that both potentials still exist. And we have to be careful not to conflate uh, technologies, however. I, I actually never used the word internet even once in, in my opening comments at all. And that might have been uh, intentional or otherwise, but most people in the world don't have access to the internet. Most people in the world are starting to get mobile phones, which is, uh, but not necessarily uh, the internet. This technological diffusion that's happening is itself not about perfectionism, right? It's a, just about possibility. It's about individual empowerment. And I think this gets to your question, empowerment with knowledge, the ability to be a correction on authority, uh, a correction on elite authority. And this is where the Arab Spring is interesting. Uh, of course, you know, currently, right now, as it stands, the Egyptian government has not, uh, you know, is no less hierarchical. Uh, and, you know, it does not look like Wikipedia. Uh, it is not, networks have not replaced the hierarchical structure of that government. That doesn't mean that that networks are not useful tools in challenging hierarchies and in reframing them and in being this corrective on power. And those networks are comprised of those individuals who have experienced a certain kind of empowerment, um, not purely through technology, but various forms of, of diffusion of knowledge. And I think that's extremely important for us to appreciate that. Now, to, to the political. We haven't, I haven't heard all day, I think, the, the, the word that, that uh, defines really one of the most secular, profound shifts that we're experiencing all over the world, and that is devolution. And devolution is something that is not necessarily rooted in, in technological change. It's about demographics, it's about urbanization, it's about finance, but it's, it's certainly about politics. It's happening in democracies and in non-democracies. Uh, it's hard to think of a, a country in the world that isn't experiencing in some way this fragmentation of, of ironclad central authority in some way, shape, or form, particularly through the rise of cities, the power of mayors, uh, the, the desire of individuals to control their own local politics and budgets and, 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 and uh, uh, usage of resource rents and revenues and so forth. And I think devolution is extraordinarily important and it redefines the geographic locus of authority. There are people, whether it's in California or in Swiss cantons or in Afghan provinces, uh, most certainly all of India, right, which we can, you know, the world's largest democracy is not really run in New Delhi. It's run in 25 different uh, state capitals. The states are, are in, in many profound day-to-day -day and otherwise ways more powerful than their central government. This, this devolution is a huge opportunity to bring the politics down to a scale that is more human, that is more community, that is more local, uh, that is more uh, responsive. And I think that that is something that we should be thinking about uh, very much rather than having a discourse which is about the elite, which is a category that is in fact too large, almost almost infinite to, to, to really... But at, the uh, same time, sorry, but at the same time, it's a very concrete uh, thing. There, there, there is a political elite, there's a, a, a financial elite, uh, we have uh, uh, people who are running the media, uh, we have our public intellectuals, and, and there is a kind of general sense to feel let down by those elites because, quote-unquote, uh, the right here is they are, they, they are not accepting their responsibility. Yes, they come together in Davos and they have the Clinton Global Initiative or whatever, but what essentially comes out of it? So, listen, and, 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 and I do think there is, there, there is uh, at least that, that's my idea, there is something with this ruling class which, which makes that at least we, we probably don't know, have no idea what, what kind of road to take. But 
Let me just, in Joe. half a sentence, people are ignoring that ruling class. You, you are hoping for you a direct more? challenge and confrontation to that ruling class rather than witnessing the, 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 the power, reality how, how, how can we of devolution, them? of people simply saying, forget Washington, forget those leaks, we will do it our own way. That, that explains things like the rise of community banking, microcredit, and other phenomena all over the world. Those that have been ignored by elites or simply uh, subjects of elites are finding their own ways to self-govern. Not, not always good. Not always Not good. Not always good ways. No. I give you the states that have um, let the Tea Party take over their right. state governments. I mm -hmm. think, yeah, uh, by the, I think there is a kind of illusion that we tend to have that, <coughs> excuse me, the elites that are undoubtedly real know what they're doing. Um, and I think, for example, the examples that Rory gave, which are based in his case on direct personal experience in Afghanistan, apply to some extent in the very different conditions of Europe at the moment. The idea that by squeezing the uh, countries of Europe, uh, in, in, at the moment principally the southern countries, but soon the Netherlands and, and northern Europe, to cut back in services, to cut back in pensions, to cut back in all kinds of things, including in Greece, for example, anti-malarial sprays have become too expensive, it's said. It's essential to the future probity and solidarity of Europe that they stop so that malaria will creep back into urban uh, Greece. These fantasies, as it were, are genuine. That's to say it's not the case that the people who have spent all this money in Iraq and Afghanistan and then in Libya and soon perhaps in Syria. It's not the case that there is some cynical, Machiavellian, diabolical plot behind it. It's the case that they're genuinely enslaved by a vision of the future. And that's my reason, at any rate, for having my doubts about the capacity of the current elites to resolve these problems. Because what these problems challenge is a vision of the future which is deeply entrenched in their thinking, a vision in which they play a central role with the ideas and beliefs that they have. And to strip them of this leaves them um, almost uh, deranged. So they're not going to do it. They're going to press on in Europe to the bitter end. In Afghanistan, I don't know, I'm not an expert, eventually there will be a semi-withdrawal, probably not complete, because the amount of money the, the um, financial difficulties in the United States, the unpopularity of the war in the United States, etc., will force a kind of retreat of some sort. But it won't be because the absurdity of the policies has been understood any more than in Europe. It'll be because the absurdity of the policies has been understood either. And here is my kind of key point. I think here I differ profoundly from the idea that what's really creative about political life or human life is attempting the impossible. I mean, there is a kind of idea going, you know, which has been expressed here, but it's a very, very common idea, which is that what is distinctive about the modern world is this ability to challenge possibility and attempt things which are impossibility, to produce events that are not possible. Well, that's exactly, it seems to me, what was attempted in Iraq. It was exactly what is being attempted in, in, in Afghanistan. It's exactly what was attempted in the early period in, in the Soviet Union. And actually, the world as it is, with all of its horrors, it's partly a product of these impossible attempts, of course, seems to me better than the original um, conceptions in many, in, in, many, in many cases, because they involve the destruction of so much. Obviously, there's a lot wrong with traditional Afghan culture, which a lot that we would object to, and um, that I would certainly regard as uh, as wrong, but the idea that it can be restructured, reformed, transformed in a, in a decade or a generation, it's a complete fantasy. So the real question I have is this, why is this fantasy, I've given part of the answer, but I have to confess it still puzzles me more deeply, why is, why is this fantasy so deeply rooted? Part of the answer, I think, is that for many people, the fantasy that um, uh, these, uh, that uh, there can be a uh, a transformation of whole societies, whole cultures can be engineered by regime change or technology or political revolution 
a purer Bolshevik revolution, a better global revolution, a better, more popularly uh, distributed technologies, is part of this, become part of the meaning of their life. They get the meaning of their life from that, and so to be deprived of that plunges them into a kind of despair. So um, maybe that's something we should start thinking about, whether it makes sense to uh, invest the meaning of one's life in impossible projects. Rory, you, you are, as a member of parliament, um, inside the political world. Um, do you have arguments why we, why we should continue our faith in, 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 in our political process? Or? Well, I think, that, think the answer is that we have a lot of, lot of reasons not to have faith. I mean, I, I think um, it, it's right, as, as Professor Alain said, that, that there's something very theatrical and peculiar about uh, modern parliamentary systems. I mean, it's true as a British member of parliament that one often feels that one is the, the priest of some dead religion, that the rituals that you're going through no longer have any real meaning. I mean, they once had a historical meaning. But, but now they're somehow evacuated of meaning and that, that it's just a ritual. And I think our, it's true also that, that we feel as we begin, become as societies more educated, as we know more and more about our own particular spheres, we become more and more aware of the way in which the elites don't. We become more and more disappointed by the, the lack of knowledge and maybe the lack of virtue, the lack of coherence in our elites. Uh, but the reason I would say there is a, a reason for hope is that there is a possibility of a more productive form of democratic politics. Uh, and we can see this a little bit in Britain. I mean, the, the, the thing that is very striking about a society, and this would be true of Holland too, which makes us different from a society of 50, 60 years ago, is simply that we are just much healthier, much more educated, much wealthier, and the people that I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis in my constituency, I can have a very, very serious, engaged conversation with. I mean, within their own spheres, they have extraordinary insights. People have very unusual or surprising things to say about running a business or working in a civil service department or operating as a farmer, which allow you to get into a much more exciting conversation about what's happening in Afghanistan. I mean, they understand. In other words, these problems of abstraction, isolation, unscrupulous optimism are as true of their managers and their organizations as they are of the elite internationally. And one of the things that cheers me up a little bit is that in British politics, members of parliament are being forced to spend more and more time in their constituencies justifying themselves to the constituents. The age of these sort of distant legislators is going. I was very shocked. I was in Paris uh, earlier this week meeting some French uh, public intellectuals who were saying uh, that there is no need for a British politician to worry about what the people think about Europe. This is populism. Ignore them. The point about Europe is, it is a, it's a vision of solidarity. It's a vision of Goethe and Moliere and Shakespeare coming together. It's a, it's a narrative of globalization. Uh, there is no alternative to this general progression, right? I, I felt very, very proud at that point to be a modern politician. I felt very proud to be part of a conversation where I have to justify myself to people, where I can't afford to simply talk generally about solidarity and Goethe and Moliere where anything I say has to be pushed through the medium of people in my own constituency, my own voters, understanding what on earth I'm talking about and being able to relate to it. And the thing that we need to change is how to tap that energy, how to deal with the fact that in this room is as much energy, as much brains as in any room in Republican Athens, and yet nothing's coming of it in the same way. We haven't created the structures to unleash that energy. We, we live very disappointed, disappointing lives. And one thing I think we need to do is to make people move from the apolitical sphere, where all their energies are going into their family or into their charity work or, or into their business, back into the political sphere. And at that point, you get better elites, you get better politicians when you get a better public. We need to be a better public. Mm -hmm.